Welcome back to another episode of Firefighters in Fire Trucks Getting Ice Cream. This is part two with my guest, Phil Jose. Phil is the retired deputy chief of the Seattle Fire Department and one of the instructors that was knighted by Dave Dotson to take over the Art of Reading Smoke program. Let's go get some ice cream. All right, sounds good. Hey, the door works. Oh, well, that's a good start. <laughs> we have just finished up a long drive through the streets of Salem, Oregon in a 1956 International Cooper Pumper. Our ice cream shop for this episode is Dolce Mama's. It's a great place here in downtown Salem, Oregon, where we can get some ice cream and finish up our conversation. And for this episode, we decided to do it in milkshake form. So stay tuned, part two, coming up. Hey Jesse, thanks for the shake. <laughs> Nothing like chocolate shakes, you know. Nice little day, kind of rainy out in, in uh, Salem right now, so ice yeah. cream and rain. And I like the way it looks craftsmanship, a little chocolate on the inside, a little yeah. cream on the top. You gotta <laughs> love it. Yeah, we, like we don't have enough ice cream in the fire service <laughs> already. So when we were uh, driving down, we were kind of kind of alluding to <clears throat> the other class you're doing out there a lot, which is, what's the what's the title of that one again? Well, uh, it's the instructor development class. So. Okay. Uh, it sort of depends. I, I, I tend to, to blend it a little bit with the tactics as well, right? So teaching tactical thinking or just instructor development. And uh, most of the time when I'm doing that, it's at an at a, uh, instructor conference or something like that. There's Most places there's not enough instructors that want to come in for the day to have right. an instructor focused class. But then I model those same techniques when I'm teaching my tactics class or teaching the reading smoke class. And you were talking about like questioning your students, you know, when you go to instructor one and instructor two, you learn that preparation step and the presentation and the application. Well, the hard part is that in that cognitive setting, the application step is asking questions. You're not applying, you're not managing tools or right. manipulating those. That's the application step. So as an instructor, especially new instructors, they tend to forget that it's like, that's the way you engage your students as you go along. And, you know, you kind of talked about waiting a couple seconds to let them engage. There's so many different ways that you can do rhetorical questions or overhead or uh, I have always liked direct questions, getting to know the students' names mm -hmm. and then you can put them on blast if you will, but even just knowing their names, they kind of get this, well, he can call on me at any second too. And, and uh, but really for me, one of the ones that I've really found useful, and I'm, I think I've seen you do this before, is just kind of the rebound where you're gonna get an answer from a student and then you'll throw it back to the class. Hey, where else can you add on to this? Or even when they ask me a question, you know, I don't want to sound stupid or I don't have the, you know, I'll just throw it back to the class. What do you guys think about this? And, and I've always loved that, that rebound type of thing, but waiting a second and getting the students to kind of think about the process, that they're going to learn a lot more from the people in the seats than, than the talking head up front sometimes and passing it around. But, and especially if you're teaching um, stuff where you've got some subject matter expertise in the classroom, like a lot of what you're doing or, or when I'm teaching the tactics class, uh, there is there is subject matter experts in the room. In fact, if you combine that right. subject matter expertise, combine they're probably in excess of what you're ever going to do or whatever, or whatever I'm going to do. And then, you know, they also, those folks like just recently teaching in Boston, like, yeah, I'm from Seattle and it's a big department, but I'm a novice when it comes to how this Boston Fire Department puts out a, a triple decker fire. Right. right. They are the subject matter experts. And so uh, just asking questions then when, when, like you're saying, when they give you answers, try to get other students to add in information. And there's a couple of techniques there. One is that um, you, when people are answering a question, one technique is when they're done, just give it a little bit of space because sometimes they're, they'll add more, right? But if you right. jump in, if, you, if you're waiting to jump in when they're done, then they're, they're gonna quit talking out of deference to you as the instructor. Right. right? So you, even physically, sometimes you, you know, step back a little bit and give them a little bit of space, both um, physically some space and a little bit of time, and they'll add one more element or two more elements to their right. question. And uh, another technique with that, like you're saying, is, is asking just, hey, 
does they, can anybody else add on to that or that sort of rebound and if you leave a little bit of space sometimes you'll be able to get people that will automatically add in right right or indicate to you the other thing is just be careful uh watching around because people will indicate to you that they have an idea and you can you know point to them hey what do you think about this right and and just bring them all in when i do start uh you talk about um, basically closed-ended questions where it's like somebody's name or a particular fact or right. a lot of times what I like to start with is what, are, what, what department are you from? But more, th more than that, like uh, how many rigs do you have? How many people do you have? What's the customer base that you serve? And so these are easy questions for them to answer, but what it does is it starts getting in the habit of answering the questions. Right. Remember before we talked about how a lot of instructors are in the habit of asking their own questions. Right. Well, by asking these types of questions up front, you get the students to understand that you're expecting that they're going to answer the questions. So then as you get into the material and you ask them a little more complex questions, they're, they're primed that they're going to be answering the questions, right. not the instructor. Yeah, and it's, it's one of those things as you learn, to, as a good instructor, you're learning how to apply that. You know, it's not just, well, there's a question portion at the end, where your last slide on your PowerPoint is any questions. Right. And then of course it's always too quick. Anybody, qu no questions? Okay, and they move on. Um, a new instructor can really kind of push that forward by even just putting in their PowerPoint slides every so many things, putting a question in there. If you're a, if you're a new instructor or you're a novice to making sure you use that application step mm -hmm. of asking questions, just put in your PowerPoint so it forces you to do it. But it can't be those questions like you're talking about where it's just, how many of you have a ladder truck? And they raise their hands that's not getting them to engage. That's that's not getting that cognitive knowledge out. Of them. Right, and, and as you as you start to engage with your students like that, you'll figure out pretty quick, with some experience, obviously. But um, there are a lot of experienced instructors out there, and uh, trying to figure out who might be the subject matter expert in your room, right? So if you're it, like when I was teaching in my own fire department. Like when people walk in, I mean, I can look at who's coming to the class today and tell you, right. you know, who the problem child is, who the subject matter expert is, right? Like I can know that audience before I even start. And, and a lot of the folks that do teach in the fire service have that ability to see in advance who's going to be there. But if you're working with a group of students that you don't know that well, it, after some questioning and some rebounding and some some right. input from them, you'll you'll figure out who the subject matter experts are. You want to include everyone, but there's also just, just little things like if you have somebody who you think, hey, this is a novice, you want to be really not careful. I don't want to say nice. You want to be careful about asking them questions that you have a pretty high degree of confidence that they're going to be able to answer because you don't, you don't want to make them look foolish, right? right? You want to give them an opportunity to be successful. Uh, when you have a particularly tough question, you're going to want to, to defer to the subject matter expert and say, hey, have you know sometimes one of the greatest tools I've had with subject matter is like has this ever happened to you then they can give you a short story right. that ties in the elements that you're teaching puts a human face on it and your students are going to remember that so much better right. than just the facts and figures that you have on your PowerPoint slide. especially if they're displaying here's a mistake I made on that fire or whatever you're hearing it from someone that's been around for a long time and they're saying this is where I screwed this up I mean, the value in that is huge. Um, so I, I, you kind of talked about um, problem child students, you know. What's some of the things that you've kind of caught on to, you know, that uh, some techniques that you do out there for that? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great topic. Um, you know, I just, uh, it's, in, it's in peer review now, but I have Instructor One book coming out with Penwell, hopefully next year. But uh, there's, there's a lot of techniques. One is, um, if somebody's talking a lot, like if they're interrupting, I'll often position myself near them, you know, just move over physically, put yourself near them right. and they'll generally they'll see you and whatever behavior they're doing, they'll probably stop. Most of the time they will stop. Now you might have to do that once or twice with a particularly terrible student, right? Um, sometimes I'll just stop talking and then they'll realize Right, right. It's a, that's a little more confrontational, right? Because you're right. you're sort of pointing it out. So all these things you gotta um, learn. You know, you're gonna use them, and you're gonna figure out how they work and how they don't work. Right. Uh, but at some point, um, and I've had to do this not very often, but a couple of times during a break, I'll go, I'll just go to them and say, hey, 
you know, um, I'm, this, this is the way I'm feeling about the class, you're interrupting or whatever the case may be. Right. Um, and there's only one time in my career, literally, where I had to stop class and say, okay, we're going to take a break right now and take people out right. into the parking lot in that case and have a little powwow right. uh, because the behavior was egregious enough that allowing it to stand was not acceptable. Right? And if you're going to be that person in the front of the classroom, if you're going to take on that role, and these are things that you learn over time, but, but you, you have, an, have to take ownership of the way that people interact in that class, the learning environment, all that stuff is really important. You're going to make mistakes. I mean, there's more than once where I've made a mistake and cut somebody off or, or uh, minimize their idea inappropriately and, and had to come back and, and apologize to them individually and to the class as a group. Right. And you build a lot of credibility, I think, with people when you take ownership of your own mistakes and you rec and you, uh, they know that you're taking ownership of the learning environment that you're in charge of. So if they don't give you an answer you like, you're saying that the correct response is not <laughs> like stuff like, you know, it's, it's amazing. Like there's a lot of instructorship that goes to just teaching at these fire conferences or doing classes that unfortunately a lot of instructors, it's just, well, I'll just throw up a good PowerPoint and, and talk. And it's, it's, it's definitely more complicated than just, than, than just that. Yeah, I, I tell you the, my favorite, my favorite class to teach is when I get there early and I see the instructor in front of me with his back to the audience reading the PowerPoint slide. Because here's what I know, I'm gonna look like a star. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I mean, I don't know that I'm that good, but I'm better than that. Right. And uh, that, that gets to be sort of the default, I think. Sometimes if you're teaching within your organization or the regular curriculum and, and that's what you've experienced as a student, there's a real tendency to think that's the way it's done. And uh, one of the mantras that I always have, and I didn't make it up, is that the PowerPoint doesn't teach. Really, the PowerPoint is just there. Right. Right? You're just teaching. Just keep you on track and just a couple of words on there to give you... Yeah. And the fewer words, the better, right? I think right. Uh, um, uh, Becky White talks about, uh, you know, no more than three bullet points, no more than three words per bullet point, that kind right. of stuff. because. Right. Because you, you shouldn't have to have all that stuff up there to know what you're teaching. You should you should have it here and here, right? right? And even if you practice, I mean, I, there's plenty of times I've stood in the classroom by myself with a new curriculum, practicing it, seeing where I was going to talk, seeing what I was going to say, how I was going to phrase things, right. so that on day one I'm prepared. Well, and even just, uh, but at the same time, you don't want your PowerPoint to just be pictures, because if you go back to that code of learning, we associate by reading words and, and capturing that knowledge too. So, you know, there's a fine balance between not having enough words and having too many words. The, the, the too many words tends to you as an instructor reading it or the students reading ahead of you. You know, one of the best things you can do obviously is controlling the flow of your class, use the custom animation in PowerPoint or Keynote towards dropping in a couple of bullet points here and there and, and they're not getting ahead. And even the pictures you select on each slide. I mean, it shouldn't just be, well, there's a cool picture. Right. It should be trying to gain certain, you know, tap into certain knowledge or, or recognition, you know, or repetition, if you will, that they can refer back to it in their in their mental slide care. So. Yeah, the, another technique is to take um, either, like, if uh, one of the things that I've done is you take, uh, let's say you show a video, you're 15 minutes in, you're going to show a video about something. Take, take some still shots out, out of that video, fade them, and put them behind your uh, wording on your PowerPoint. So it's not really part of the slide itself to where they're seeing a picture set off to the side, but it's, it's embedded into the background. So now what you can start to do is to have a couple of those that lead up to the video and a couple of them that trail out of the video. And so you're starting to get the mind to wrap the concepts um, right. From the, from the beginning through the video, and it, and it just visually it ties it all together. Right? But, but you're talking about really, that's really advanced stuff that you're gonna spend time on your PowerPoint. Right. For, for your new instructors, you're, you're way better off like really learning the detail that's behind those bullet points. So that they're just a reminder for you. They're not, they're not the, like I said, the PowerPoint's not teaching. You gotta teach. Right. Well, we were, I we were teaching an instructor one class not too long ago, and that was where we kind of talked about getting that effective domain, you know, getting away from the cognitive, 
And you can build effective PowerPoint to get to the effective domain if you do it right and you're, you're bringing them into the story or you're bringing it into the concept and, and making them think as opposed to just, like I said, reading bullet points and slides. And um, we were doing a, a one of the, uh, the student instructors, you know, in an instructor one class, mm -hmm. they put together a PowerPoint on water systems and water delivery systems. And they talked about one of the first fire protection water systems was in Egypt, you know, and they literally found a picture on the internet of hieroglyphics that actually showed the symbol for water, the three squiggly lines, and actually described this whole water system. Well, and we told the, the student, I said, what does that look to your student? Exactly what it is on the screen, hieroglyphics. They don't know what that means. If you're trying to tie the student's recognition to Egypt was the first water distribution system for fire suppression, just put a pyramid in there. You know, it's, it's so much easier just to kind of connect the dots, you know, and it's always about acronyms. It, it's all, it's getting them to understand what do you want them to know at the end of your class? Because they're only going to get, a, they're only going to retain a certain right. percentage of it anyways. Um, so when you build a class, we usually start from the end. What do I want my students to know at the mm -hmm. end? And then and build it backwards. Yeah, and... Um... <clears throat> This, uh, what was one of the interesting things for me about uh, getting into the standard and, and trying to write a book for Instructor One is, is that Instructor One, um, you know, the first thing it says in there is given a given a lesson plan, right? right. So for an, for an Instructor One, really you're taking a, you should be taking a lesson plan that somebody else built and you're modifying and it. then you're learning how to teach it, right? Right, and you're, you're, you're learning it well enough that you can adjust it to the crowd that you have, the room that you have, um, you know, those sorts of things. But you, you, it, but you still have to take ownership of it and make it yours in order to be, I think, to be effective right. at teaching it. Right. Well, even that, it's amazingly you get a lot of these curriculums from outside vendors and they're breaking every PowerPoint rule in the book. You know, they're not even doing the six by six rules and there's words and words yeah. and words on their PowerPoint. For an instructor class, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, and just a, uh, one technique there for, for new instructors is just systematically move stuff from the slide itself down into the notes below. So if you're looking at, at PowerPoint, I haven't used Presley much, but I assume it has a, a similar function where you look at the notes version, you know, down below the slide itself is that the notes for the instructor notes and that's a great place to just take just take words out right and put them down there till you just have the central core of the idea up there that you're going to expand upon yeah and and prez is a great tool and articulate i don't know if you've ever started messing mm -hmm. with articulate but it's powerpoint on steroids it's there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with that uh, but like you said it, that's all behind the scenes things when you start learning how to use Keynote or PowerPoint to make it to where you can tap into those models. Just get the baseline knowledge out there and know the knowledge. Um, I mean, that's that's the first step. Yeah, and, and all of those, th those are all things like when uh, you and I, you or I is teaching an uh, instructor development class, we're bringing our, you know, our, our year, some, some of our experience hard, hard won, right? I've made those mistakes in the classroom. I've stood up there and read a PowerPoint. I'm not going to tell you that one day I woke right. up and I was a great instructor. But uh, through, through uh, teaching is a craft in and of itself. And people spend a lifetime learning how to be a good teacher. Right. And so if you're going to be a fire instructor, you have to embrace to some degree the craftsmanship of, of being a teacher. Right. How do they do things? Read some articles about uh, uh, how teachers do things, how, how they interact, how they ask questions, understand what open and closed and, and all those sorts of things are right. so that you can at least learn enough to be a little bit better of an instructor than maybe uh, the last instructor you had or the instructor that you're going to be in five years. And if all you do is stand in front of the room and read the PowerPoint, you're going to be this, it's a, that old adage about uh, it's experience in the fire department. Do you have five years of experience or do you have one year of experience five times? Right. You know, and what we need is, is, is folks on the instructional side, but also on the craftsmanship side of what we do on the fire grounds. Like you're constantly learning, you're constantly training. Yes. Right. And if you're doing that for your fire department experience, your EMS experience, like taking that experience and building on it, do the same thing. If you're going to, if you're going to engage to be an instructor, do that same thing. Yeah. Well, and that, that's the thing, too, is when you look at instructorship and you, like I said, you learn over time, 
I, teaching instructor one now, it's a completely different thing than when I first started teaching. One of the things is we, I do a class on effective PowerPoint building, and I show some of my early on PowerPoints oh. when I first start, and I'm like, horrible background. <laughs> Look, I, you can barely see the words on there, and, it, the, and the, oh, the picture on that, this is before I learned, I'll do a Google search for a picture that I want to use, and I grab the thumbnail off of the search, and I put that in the PowerPoint, and it's all grainy. You know, and it's amazing, like now that I teach instructor, there's so many things now that I look at some of my old PowerPoints, and, but I show them in class, like look, I get it. This When I first started, these are some of the PowerPoints that I had, and I'm violating all the rules that we're talking about today. You know? Yeah, and, and the other thing for me, one of the things that I love about teaching is having a big whiteboard or a flip chart. And we're talking about a class where you can where you can use it. You know, if you're teaching two or three hundred students, you know, you can't be up there with a flip chart because they can't from the back of the room they can't see it. Right. Right. You can use a Kermit or something like that in those cases. But just the old thing about being having being able to have a whiteboard there and some colored markers right. and drawing a picture of a house and saying, hey, you know, because when you're when you're training like in tactics what you need if you want people making decisions and saying here's where i would lay lines stuff you need enough uh, uh fidelity which is the the that's the educational word but enough realism that they emotionally buy into the fact that they're arriving at the house it can be a drawing on a whiteboard it can be a still photo it can be a video right you can you can have a big simulation but it doesn't all have to be big simulations that cost tens of thousands of dollars. Those are great. Trust me, you can get a lot of value right. drawing a picture of a two-story wood frame house on a blackboard with some red and some smoke and, and right. that sort of stuff. Or say, the layout of that house. Yeah, you know, what would you point. do here? Right. What, if you rolled in here, what would you do? What line would you pull? How long would it take? What are the advantages of that plan? And that, you know, getting them engaged is what's important. Getting them to buy in is what's important. The fidelity of the exercise should only add to right. that learning. And, and you can you can definitely get some scenario stuff. I've been to some sims where it's like, I'm so enthralled with the sim. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know? Right. Like like in and I'm sure you've worked with some where you're, you know, like it takes you two or three reps just to be comfortable in how the thing works. Now I can start engaging in the actual right. tactics, or just right? The so the fallacies of how the simulation's built. Yeah, you know, complex doesn't necessarily make it better. Sometimes right. simple is is the best. Well, and, and technology comes into that. Obviously, you talked about the Kermit or an Elmo. You know, we're, we're using the, the Muppets as teaching <laughs> tools now. But uh, you know, just uh, we had a class the other day where one of the students just set up his cell phone and they literally translated it up to the to the projector screen. And they were recording themselves on something small. They were giving a class on like the BK radio. Well, obviously, 50 students in the classroom can't see you manipulating the buttons. On right. That. So he had his camera on a tripod and he was manipulating and was transferring over the big screen, you know. And Beautiful. The technology, I mean, that's a big thing to the teaching now. I, I, I did a magazine article called The 60s of Fire Service Learning a couple of years ago, you know, uh, teaching, triumph, tra tradition, tragedy, all those types of things. And I'm getting ready to redo it and add number seven in there is technology because your teaching style, technology can enhance it or it can be a complete detractor from it. Um, you talked about the simulations and that's why I think that a lot of the instructors that after doing it for a while, they want to teach tactics and strategy because there's so much to being able to tap into those students, throw a picture of a fire up there and not get chirp chirp out of when you go, okay, what would you do here? Because it, it really puts firefighters on the spot to talk about their tactics and strategy in the classroom. Now you really have to bring your instructorship. Being a good strategic and tactician stuff as an instructor is, is a big part of that, but it's also being able to, as an instructor, draw that out of them without making them, like I said, putting, putting them in a bad spot or running them over with the bus. Yeah, that's why one of the, I mean, my tactics class is one of the favorite classes that I teach because it, it brings to bear a lot of the skill set I have from, uh, you know, 30 plus years in the Seattle Fire Department.